good evening everyone uh, today me uh, anurag singh and lovkush welcomes you all to the fifth edition of mutant speaks which is conducted by ist nit calicut students chapter this is our month- monthly webinar series uh, where we invite guests who just break all the limitations there are to the box of creativity just like ingenious scientist sir isaac newton Tonight we have a great personality among us who has played a significant role in introducing us to a scientist who all of us as at least undergraduates look up to and definitely respect and hope of becoming someday. Uh yes everyone we have Mr. Pete Michaels with us uh best known as the director of the top Netflix animated sitcom Rick and Morty. Yeah, I'll take a moment to take that in. Okay. Um he's also worked on like many other uh, famous animated uh, shows. Some of them you may know some of them uh you would have heard but definitely you would have heard uh kid notorious family guy uh rugrats rocco's modern life bless the heart uh, the list goes on and on oh, it's fine of which it's fine <laughs> oh banar is too short to name all his animations <laughs> it's too short <laughs> so wow. now in the delay uh, let's find out the journey of mr peach michael from the background layout artist to the director of the simpsons the greatest animation show and the longest one yet from the man himself and more good news i had for all the attendees like if you have any good question uh, which you would like to ask to mr pete michael uh, you can uh, share you can yep. send us some you can send a message to uh, the host in the chat I think he's having some internet issues. Sorry, sir. Uh, yeah. You can send you can send some messages to the host in the chat if you have any questions desired. Uh, sir, would you like to take over? Yes. So thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And yeah, I'll be able to answer questions at at the end. And uh, so you can all see me, right? Everything's yes, working. Out. Yeah. Great. Everything's working. Yeah. Well, just to to start off. Um, yeah. I I uh, what I do is I'm. I'm a supervising director director and what I do is um my role as supervising director is I get to oversee the hiring of the crew and the artists and um I get to um um oversee the directors as a supervising director I'm the director of the directors so I get to cool. see um I get to to hire the directors hire the crew um and also i get to oversee the whole production as a whole not just like for as an episodic director if my job was episodic director i would just be responsible for one episode and then maybe overlap with two or three other episodes um but as a supervising director i kind of see the big picture and oversee the whole thing so i go from um i'm in on the beginning from design to um to storyboards to um editing uh post production and right all the way up to delivery of the final episode. When I first started in the business I I was right out of school. I I had finished at UCLA and The Simpsons was hiring. It's a new show in town and and uh, up before The Simpsons there wasn't much going on in terms of animation. But um once Roger Rabbit came out who framed Roger Rabbit and then The Simpsons was brand new mm-hmm. and they were hiring. So I was in the right place at the right time. um just finished school and they were looking for artists on the simpsons but you had to take a test so what you're looking at on the left is my very first drawing of homer simpson and uh I was right at school I did not know what I was doing I didn't I had never uh, really worked professionally before I didn't know how to break down characters how to how to pose them that there was structure underneath the characters that was a, so you can look at homer he's all kind of floppy there and his proportions are weird but Uh, years later I I found that drawing and I I used to hang it up when I was a family guy I would hang it up across my desk I'm like okay if I have a bad day of drawing Stewie I just look at this Homer and like I feel better okay it's not, it's not as bad as I <laughs> so I would then so uh, once I I I scan that one time I'm like you know what I'm going to just see if I if, you know, I'm going to correct that drawing so what you're looking at on the right is I corrected the Homer drawing after a couple of years of working on the shows and working in animation now I I knew better what to do so when I started out I asked a lot of questions I didn't know so I didn't get hired on that that first drawing I had to take the test twice and even then I wanted to do characters but I didn't pass that second test either but um the producers saw that I knew perspective and I can in my background I was able to draw um the house and the couch and and the backgrounds well enough to get hired as a background artist so Once I get hired as a background artist, my foot was in the door. And at that point I started asking everybody everything that they knew about character design, 
character layout, character posing, how we put acting in characters, how to make structure in their characters. And if you look, you see Homer does have some shapes there, so he's solid, so he's got volume. Um, I learned about, my director came in, into our crew and said, hey, anybody want to learn storyboarding? I'm like, yeah, I'll learn storyboarding. So I was learning everything along the way. And eventually, I was there long enough to eventually move up to director and oh. learn every bit as I could, as much about production as I could. Um, <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is like, just go through a typical production. So it, it starts with the script. So we start with an, an animated shows. There's two different ways to do it. There's you can start with the with the script or an outline. For most adult animated shows like Simpsons, Rick and Morty, <laughs> the guy, those are all it starts with the script. And what you're um, what you're seeing, what I'm going to show you here is it's this is just the typical script. And you've all seen scripts. We all kind of know what what the scripts look like. Um, oh, it's uploading the whole thing. Um, and uh, outline driven shows are basically you get, and that's mostly for children shows um, with the script with, with the outline driven shows, it starts with an outline, just the basic outline is like SpongeBob gets a driver's license and you as a director and storyboard artist then get to um, write as you go. You take that basic story premise and write it as you go um, thereby creating the episode. And it starts then once we have a script and we have our characters, our main characters, we will then have um, a, a character lineup, <clears throat> which is basically something like this. <clears throat> what you're looking at here is the, the, the Rick and Morty, the basic family lineup, the whole family. And this shows us, as you can see, they've got the lines going across, that's their height lines. So we can all see how tall they are compared to Rick. So we always take one character and that's our main character, in this case, Rick, and, and you can see Rick and Morty on the left there. So what we do is draw the characters and size them in relationship to each other. So we always know, because sometimes you have 100 people drawing on the show. So we always know um, how tall Morty is compared to Rick, how tall Summer is compared to Rick. Um, this way, we can always keep track of <clears throat> you know, making sure that it's consistent from shot to shot, because you have a lot of different people drawing at the same time. And even breaking that down further, um, you can then see uh, we then break that down a little bit further and then we take one specific character and we have a lot of turns just for that one. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more. So you can see here like Rick has, you know, we have like, this looks like this is a seven, eight point turn. We can oh. then see what Rick looks like from each angle. So we can see like, okay, this is from this front, this is from the a little bit from the side of three quarter, and we have several different versions and, and a profile and what he looks like from the back. So this way we all know every time you turn Rick, you know what the back of his head looks like, what the, what the back of his shoes look like, if he has anything on the back of his shirt. And this way it's also keeps consistent. And what, we're, what you're seeing here too is like, well, this gets sent to the animators and we use a program called Harmony. I'll show a little bit of that in a bit. Um, and it gets rigged. We get what we call rigging. Like they take that character and break it apart into different parts so that they can move the and animate the arms, animate the face. There's libraries of facial expressions, mm -hmm. libraries of hands that we could just use. Um, sometimes we have to redraw a hand to make it work with it. If he's holding a weapon or something, or holding a drink or eating. Uh, but for the most part, we have libraries of hands that we can just pull up and reuse. And that then comes. Let's go to. Uh, So there's a lot of design uh, that goes into it. <clears throat> and here is a, here's a Homer Simpson turnaround. So Homer has a little bit less turnarounds, to, but again, you can see, this is what Homer looks like from the back. This is what he looks like from the side. This is what the rear three quarters, you see a little bit of his nose, a little bit of his mouth. So Homer, as you can see, only has five versions of the turn. And that's because uh, The Simpsons is a hand-drawn traditional animated show. So it, it's up to the animator to, to kind of extrapolate from these turns what Homer would look like and slightly different in-between angles or what we call in-betweens. Whereas with Rick, it's a rig show. So the animators are using a computer program that has all the parts in the library oh. and manipulating those. So you need to have a lot more turns in that because you're not drawing as much. With a traditionally animated show, you're drawing a lot more. So. And then with, um, of course, then that will enable us to, to see what Homer looks like 
in different positions and then we have to just pose them out and these are some old drawings of mine from uh oh, this is where this huh. is the scene where homer got beat up by the, the uh, london he was in london and got beat up by the, by the london police um uh i think he's trying to break into buckingham palace but <laughs> as you can see it's like we have to make sure that homer is is consistent from pose to pose. So each one of these is a different drawing that we would animate to. So we would take these and animate from one to the next to the next so that um, he was consistently in the size and he didn't change size as he moved. We want to make sure that he's a real, he's like a real person to us. So we want to make sure that comes across on screen. So this, in, in this case, these are all side by side, but in, in, uh, in the production, this would be one pose and animate to the next one to the next one. And of yeah, I, I actually I, I saw this uh, pick of this in your blog too. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, in some my website. <laughs> yep. So this is uh, that's that's how we work with pose to pose, and then uh, from there we go to. Um, um, so this is an exposure sheet. What is this does is it enables us each one of these lines is a frame of film, a thirty five millimeter film. So twenty four of these lines is one second. So that shows you how many drawings it takes. So there's a drawing for each one of those lines. But in animation, we use two, what we call two. So we draw every other frame. So your eye can pick up the movement without direct to drawing every single frame. We can draw every other frame. But sometimes we go every frame as well. Features like Disney features, that's all on ones. It's a drawing every frame. And also computer animation, um, like Pixar movies, those are all one frame per one drawing per frame or one um, movement per frame. Um, and then, of course, we have like, our camera instructions and also layers and dialogue, which I'll show you in a second also. So it's very, it's very complicated um, technically. Um, so we would take those exposure sheets and we would draw something. Uh, we would write basically the instructions. And if you could see that, you see that okay? Yeah. This is basically, this is, this is the instructions of what to do with the drawings. So we do what is called pre-productions. The production is broken down to three parts. So Pre-production, production, and post-production. Pre-production is everything from the script, recording the dialogue for the characters, uh, the designs, the background designs, uh, the storyboards, and this is the timing of the animation. And then for The Simpsons, it gets sent to, to South Korea, where there's studios in South Korea that do all the in-between, the production work. Production mm -hmm. is the animation. So pre-production is everything up to actual animation. Production is the actual animation, where the, the animators do all the in-betweens, do all the poses, do all the animate the mouths, the expressions, the eye movements, and everything. And then it gets traced, retraced and cleaned up and then color, uh, the color gets added. And then the background layer gets put in, it gets composited. It used to be on film where it was shot on film. Now it's composited. So they use a program called a storyboard, uh, no, um, Harmony. Um, and then it gets exported and then comes back to the States. And then when we get the, the um, color footage, the take ones, then we're in post-production and post-production is where you do fix any mistakes, any animation mistakes. Sometimes the color's wrong or color pops or something didn't get colored in or a mouth pops off or a head sometimes is missing or an arm is missing. Um, or we want to punch up the animation, make it faster, make it slower. Um, and that's all post-production. That's also included with uh, the music is added, the sound effects are added. And, next. and so this is the instructions of what to do when we send the, the storyboards and layouts and the designs. This is the instructions of what to do with all those drawings. Uh, and of course, we have a you know, background layout. And here's this is an old one from this is from Bugs Bunny. This is from the 40s or 50s, I think it is. So you can see back uh, before it was digital, this was drawn on paper. It was all hand drawn on paper back then, which was amazing that you could do all that without the help of a computer just to it, it boggles my mind today because we expect everything to happen so fast we just, oh, we just render it and you see it right away in <laughs> like 10 seconds before that you had to shoot it on film you had to send it to the lab it had to get processed the film had to come back and the editor had to put it back together and sync it up with a dialogue and it would take sometimes a week before you got to see if your animation worked so now we can see it right away you just hit render and it plays and it's like oh okay i can fix that adjust that so we're spoiled that we're so spoiled by computers, but it's just it amazes me that, that you, it, it still takes a lot of patience, but back then you had to have even more patience. Um, so this is a basic layout with, you can see the, the red drawings of Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd here. So this is the background layout, but 
the characters are placed on there for placement so you know where they, they they're sitting on this log you have to be able to make the background scale match the animation and you can see that red outline drawings here and also you see at the top these little holes um, the paper had to be registered, so there were holes in the paper so that uh, there were pegs that you put every drawing on so that it would always be registered in place so it didn't move around. So it's it's a little brief little history lesson there. Um, so what we that's kind of a layout, but we also have design as part of the process and here's a background design. This is done in Photoshop. So a lot of what we do in design is for this was a, a show for Adult Swim, another uh, it was written by one of the Rick and Morty writers, also starring Justin Roiland um, as the dog. Um, this is a background design. So the animators and the storyboard artists knew like, okay, this is what the living room looks like for this character. So we would know, okay, if we're close on him, we could, we know there's a picture on the wall or a globe or books on the shelf. And you can see a little a transparent character of the main character here. That's for size placement. So we knew how big the characters were in the background. And then again, we have like 100 people drawing it sometimes. It has to be consistent because if you have 100 people drawing the same thing, it's going to be 100 different ways. So we have to be constant, constantly looking out for that. So this would be a background design. And of course, we have um, um, that we go into um, storyboards. And then this is an old uh, version of, again, we do digitally now. It's all digital storyboards. But this is a sample of a Simpson storyboard that was drawn on paper. So for years it was drawn on paper, but we didn't have to be so um, uh, tight with the poses. You can see we, you know, we make things a little wider. It's like, oh, it's too tight. We'll just make it. We use the white out and then redraw the frames. Like, oh, we want this to be wider. Um, you can see camera moves in here indicated on this first panel. You can see arrows going in. We start wide and we zoom in a little bit to the guys in the in the booth. Uh, but you can see that you can still see the the drawings are pretty much there. You can see what the angle is. Um, these are pretty tight drawings. These look like I think Brad Abelson drawings. But um, you can see what we had to do is like even tape the take the script. We cut apart the script and taped it onto the storyboard. So you can see what lines go with which panel and which shot, which scene. Um, now it's a little bit easier. So now we go into now we're a little bit more into um, we do all digital storyboards. So before it was you... so much of hard work, right? I'm sorry. Uh, like before, it was way too much of hard work. Now it's a bit easier, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah, it's much easier and faster too. It's much faster and um, yeah, is, you can do a lot. Better, like uh, uh, if you compare the quality, like uh, is it better? Obviously. Uh yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think it's gotten better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even you know, the, I mean, The Simpsons kind of evolved. All shows evolved, you know, from the yeah. first season. It's a little different. You'll see, like, if you look at first season, second season Simpsons to today Simpsons, the characters are much looser. Um, like and that, the, yeah, they always have the thing that it's hand drawn or it's digital. You can tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can tell. And you know, it's become a lot tighter. So now we, we just it's just a lot easier to make sure that the characters stay on, on what we call on model, and mm -hmm. even storyboards. And this is this is the pencil storyboard. So now we we use um, a program called uh, Toon Boom uh, Storyboard Pro. So this is, a, this is a, a company in Canada that makes this software that uh, we mostly use for TV animation. Some storyboards are still done in, in um, you can do them in Photoshop. Some boards are done in Photoshop. Um, Features uses a, a program called Flix, which is similar, but um, it's closer to Photoshop. But Storyboard Pro, it enables us to, as you can see here is like, you know, different shots, different scenes. We can have I can have my camera move here. I have different layers. I can have the house on the layer, the shadows on the layer, the car in a separate layer. If I wanted to move the car, do different panels of the car. And you can do, uh, I can change out characters easily. I can change the backgrounds really easy. I can do scene numbers in a second, whereas before I had to erase scene numbers or write them all in, or even, I don't have to worry about page numbering anymore. Um, I don't have to use a Xerox like with the paper boards. We had to like if we wanted something to be bigger or smaller, yeah. we have to run to the Xerox machine, size it up, and then cut it out and tape it on. Now I don't have to worry about okay. that. I I just grab the drawing if I want the drawing to be too big or so bigger or smaller and scale it up or scale down. So it is so much faster, and so much easier now. Um, so that's that's pretty much what what I look at every day is <laughs> it's our storyboards. Um, and also in design, just to make the, the characters 
talk, we use, um, as you see, like the part of the design, you saw the turnaround, but how do you make the characters talk? And you saw the X sheets that have each frame, but also on the X sheets is the dialogue written phonetically, written in a column. Yeah. Then what we do is we have a, a different mouth shape for each one of those um, sounds that the character's voice is making. So the, the, and they're labeled, here they're labeled, the industry standard is to label them with letters. Um, some shows have more. This is just the basic one that I did for, for myself, but. Looks like adventure time, kind of. It is, it is fascinating. It always fascinated me as a kid. It's like, how do you make characters talk? That's just amazing yeah. to do that. And it's really just a series of different mouth shapes that are placed on layers. So, you know, the, the, the A mouth would be for the M sounds, like underneath you'll see the, the sounds that that mouth shape corresponds with. So the, uh, the closed mouth would be for M's and B's and P's, um, anything where the blips come together. You have a smaller mouth with, with uh, for A, uh, E, eh, and a, big, a little bit bigger mouth for A, A, uh, E, A, uh, and then a larger one if the character's yelling or, or you know, really happy or a big accent, like, wow, you have to have a bigger mouth for those for those sounds. Mm -hmm. And of course, for the R sound, it kind of, your lips kind of make an R, or the OO sound, you know, the lips could go ooh. Yeah. And for Zs and Ss, you kind of like S. And then of course, you know, the, for L and it's a specific one for the tongue up, goes up to the roof of your mouth, make it L shape. And of course the F and the B shape where the upper teeth go over the lower lip. So you put these all in sequential order in the right order, matching the sounds and your character talks and it comes alive. It's, it's, <laughs> um, it's actually once you, once you see how it works, it's like, oh, it kind of takes, it's like, like knowing a magician's tricks, right? Yeah. Once, once you know, <laughs> the magician did it, like, oh, it kind of it spoils it for me. So I just put <laughs> the animation for everybody. Uh, so now you'll know how it works. Um, but I think I can also see if I can share um, something here. Um, I can share also um, the program that we use to do this is um, another Toon Boom product. Uh, some shows do um, hand-drawn animation where it's, it's composited and painted in Photoshop usually, uh, or there's some shows that, that um, like a, a traditional, like a CG show, like, like um, or movies like Pixar, or they have their own softwares or yeah. uh, a show I worked on Scholar and Landers Academy or some of the Disney shows, like I think um, 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 more of a CG look. And that's done in a program called Maya. And what they do yeah. is they build the characters and then and they still have all the designs and the mouth charts and things too. So you have to know how big to make the mouth and expression. But they they manipulate the characters in the 3D space. So there's an environment built and then you can move the camera. The great thing about that is you can put the camera anywhere you want. If you don't like it here, you can move yeah, it slightly sure. over here. You have to redraw everything. But oh, wow. with 2D animation, we have to redraw everything if we want to move the camera. So it's it's flat artwork, but we can kind of simulate depth. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you like this, the Harmony workspace, and this is basically what and here's you know what Stewie would look like, and and they're they do oh. their, Family Guy still works traditionally with um, hand drawn animation. Oh. Um, but it's still composited in a program similar to this, where you just you have layers, and you can see I put the onion skin on it for this, image, yeah. where you can see the the black outlines are the current drawing, the red outlines are the previous drawing, mm -hmm. the green are the the following drawings. So you can see, like just to make Stewie point, it might take six or seven drawings to get his point hand uh, to point. So that's that is the, the program that we use to, uh, and then you can see here is another version. This is a, a, a bit I'm working on for my own, but you can see here that it's labeled, um, you know, all the parts and uh, as everything is labeled, and I'm, I could just select the head. It's all separated yeah. by layers. So this is all the body layer, the head layer, the eye layer, the mouth layer. They're all layers, and I can manipulate them all together and link them together and put them as parents and link them and move them. Um, and so that that is how the animation itself works. But to do, um, I also did in post. I'll share this one. This is it's kind of fun. Once we get the post, we get the footage back. We do the next step, which then is um, 
the next step is to do uh, post. And in post, I make a lot of corrections. Like, for instance, here is one I took. This is the original footage I did a screen grab of, but I wanted a different pose of Rick. So you can see, and a different pose of Morty had to be angrier. So you can see Morty's his old arms under here. But yeah. I wanted to do a different pose. Of Morty. So Morty is want, angry half of the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's very frustrated. Yeah, it's really angry. So, um, so here and Rick, of course, is his usual pose. I I repose Rick so he's a little more relaxed. So what I did is just do a screen grab of it and drew the new pose over in on another layer in red. Um, just so that I would send this to the animators and this Rick and Morty, the animation itself was done in Canada in Vancouver. So the the um, um, storyboards and writing and recording and designs, everything is done here in LA, but the animation is done in, in, in Vancouver. They send us the footage back, we make our changes and we send some um, corrections back to them. In this case, it was a new pose from Morty so they could open up the file, reanimate it to these new poses and then send us another a take two back. And then that way, yeah, we just kind of refine it until like, okay, that's approved, and we put it in until we get the whole thing done. Um, uh, wait, uh, is that a mouse on coffee shop? <laughs> oh, was it? It looks like a mouse. <laughs> oh, where? Like, oh, back here? Oh, no, there's a whole yeah. bunch of aliens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's all different aliens that uh, we had. We had <laughs> what we did do is we had like a library of aliens that we use. Like, okay. <laughs> Choose this one, alien number two, alien number three, alien number 40. Yeah. We had like a library yeah. built of it. We also had a library of incidental character, human characters too. So when they're in, on Earth or in their normal, their normal environment, or they go to the mall, you see different people. You might see, characters. Yeah, you might start, start seeing the same people. Like, hey, yeah. wait, that guy was in episode four, <laughs> two. And yeah, so we, we, we actually don't know, like, we don't know which planet um, uh, Rick will go next to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and sometimes they go to a different dimension. Um, there's like, uh, or a different world. There's like different creatures or different beings that inhabit that world. That with Rick and Morty, sometimes you you couldn't reuse the library. Like, well, we can't use these guys because we saw them in the in the Saint Lupi's hospital. Yeah, uh, on that ship. But there's a whole new world, like the the Jurians. You know, where we create a whole new species of aliens, the ones with four arms. And then blow them up at the end of the episode. It's like, well, we can't reuse them because we they blew up. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it kind of gets gets stuck in, in things. Um, let me show you like an, an example of an animatic. So what this is, this is an animatic. So this is what we then take these storyboard drawings and edit them all together with the dialogue of the scene and time it all out so we have our plan for this basically a pencil test of the animation. So this is a scene of Family Guy where um, Peter and Brian have jury duty, and uh, Peter has to adjust the blinds. You may have seen this. Peter, what are you doing? It's getting very tense in here. Do you guys mind if I struggle to open these blinds? Stay up there. You gotta yank it to the side, Peter. I'm yanking it as far as it goes. You gotta catch it on the thing. Oh, that's helpful. The left side's getting lower than the right side. I can see what's happening. Now twist it. All right. See? Now it's open. <laughs> so that's that's what an animatic is. That's basically <laughs> once we have um, you know, all the drawings in place, we have all the dialogue recorded, and we then you know, put that together. And so now we know how long the piece is. And like we know, like for Family Guy, for instance, it had to be 22 minutes long. With streaming shows, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to stick to a set, uh, a broadcast length because obviously there's advertisements and, and the next show yeah. comes on at 8 30 or whatever. So you had, you only had like 22 minutes to 20, 23 minutes of animation for a half hour show. So you had to make sure that it wasn't too long or wasn't too short. Whereas the streaming shows with like Netflix and, and Hulu, um, yeah, it doesn't it's matter. <laughs> sometimes the shows are 30 minutes long, sometimes they're 24 minutes, sometimes they're 20 minutes. It depends on the story. Whereas, you know, this we had to make sure it was to length. So this also gives us the clues like how the timing will work if it's, you know, if it needs to be a faster pace or a slower pace. This way we can have an idea. And then this would then get sent overseas also with the instructions on the exposure sheets. So they know because you can see like obviously Peter's mouth wasn't moving and it's not in color. 
but it's pretty close to what the final product will be. Whereas this then is like our blueprint for the animation. Um, let's see if I can share another one. How are we doing on time? Oh, let me share one more. Um, this is a Rick and Morty uh, with a little bit of The Simpsons. Um, this is an animatic of Rick and Morty, The Simpsons. We're on The Simpsons. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen the couch gag for The Simpsons where the Rick and Morty show up. Well, yeah, yeah. Matt, they wanted to yeah. connection to The Simpsons. Yeah, Matt Groening apparently is a huge fan of uh, of Rick and Morty. So we had Matt, uh, we invited Matt to do a DVD commentary on season one. And he said he liked the show so much <laughs> that he wanted and invited us to do a couch gag for The Simpsons. And we're like, wow. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be. And for me personally, having started my career on The Simpsons, to do a couch gag with Rick and Morty on The Simpsons, I'm doing The Simpsons again. Like, I get to draw Homer again. I get to draw Ned Flanders again. Great. So this was uh, storyboarded by um, uh, one of the directors, uh, Juan Meza Leon, who's a great storyboard artist. And he storyboarded the, the, the this animatic, and, and I directed him and, and um, you know, he added some things here and there. But this is basically the, the blueprint of what where that started and what that became and i'll just i'll just play it oh my god what did you do you killed oh the my god, Morty. no no i i i, I didn't oh, go, go, go. god look at the baby one. Oh my god morty oh my god look at the little baby oh my one. God. Oh no this is horrible i killed the simpsons i killed the, you simpsons. Killed the entire simpsons morty they're beloved family morty they're 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 they're, they're, they're national uh, treasure and you killed them I, I, i'm just a kid Relax, Morty. Calm down. We'll take care of it. Here. Oh man. Oh. All right. Hold that. You can see we use yellow for the okay, to make sure the Simpsons are. Make us new Simpsons. You understand me, Morty? Me? What, what are you gonna do? Morty, I gotta clean this place up before somebody comes snooping around. You know how many characters there are in the Simpsons, Morty? There's like a billion characters. They, they did an episode where George Bush was their neighbor. All right. Can't argue with that. Now this changed a little bit, and these are these you can see are pencil drawings that were scanned. And then we had gotten the background information from the Simpsons artists. And again, we use color on the on the storyboard just to make sure that indicate that's we knew that was the Simpsons in there. Because huh. then we would send this to the, the network executives for approval. As you can see, it's a little rough. Like Rick is pretty much on model here, but some poses he's not. Some poses he's a little rougher. Some poses yeah. he's not there. Yeah. Sometimes he's evil. Sometimes he's good. Sometimes yeah. he's evil good. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this would have music and sound effects added later. But we knew we had like two minutes to play with with this, and we would add the music. I did like, oh, neighbor. Looks like you got a spaceship in your oh you. Always love name planters. <laughs> now that, I'm back. Wake up. Wake up. Jesus, it's about time, Morty. Give me those. The ending got changed a little bit, but you can see here like we did some um there would be some morphing with the characters that had to be hand drawn animation. Yeah. I'm driving. Man. <laughs> there are things like, like um, you know, we did have like when Flanders fell over and crashed, we would have to make sure that um, his sound effect didn't step on Bart's line. So um, we would make sure that uh, you know. We, so we once we added sound effects, everything too, we had a little bit more um, play with it. You know. To, to make sure yeah. to get it right. Um, but let me see if I can stop sharing that. Where's that other window? So let's see. Oh, we're getting close to time. Um, so I want to open up for a question. Did you guys want to? Uh... Yeah, actually, we have some questions. Yeah, actually. So... Okay, great. Let me see if I can stop sharing. <laughs> so go ahead. Uh, um... and these... Like people are just drowning in nostalgia right now. They're just like shooting questions left, right, and center. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Okay, uh, you've worked on a lot of shows till now, right? Uh, like a lot, a lot. Like, so what would your favorite episode be in all shows? Of all the shows? Down. Yeah, on all shows, your worst favorite episode, hands down. <laughs> oh, um, I would have to say there's there's two actually two favorite episodes. Um, I love I love all the Simpson Halloween specials. Those are always fun to do. Um, my favorite is the Frankenstein Halloween episode with Mr. Burns and Smithers when they they put a they put Homer's brain in a robot and uh, that one. Yeah, it's really funny. But um, more recently, my favorite episode of all the ones I've worked on it has to be the um, interdimensional cable episodes of, of Rick's Minutes, where Rick is watching cable TV from different dimensions. And which season? That was uh, season one, yeah. And they season did one, another, okay, huh? <laughs> yeah, we did another one in season two. But yeah. Season one is still my favorite because it was a lot of ad lib dialogue. Justin would just he would just make up stuff and we would draw it. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't scripted. He would just come up with the stuff off the top of his head. Like yeah, all the like two movies. bros. The two brothers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Mr. Sneezy, and even the other ones later on with the car, man versus car. Oh, ah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and the kitten's grandma. <laughs> yeah, and, and, the, and the grandma <laughs> with the cats. And uh, those were just so fun to do because they were just, they were improv, basically. And they were a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> they still hold up. Hmm. Um, so move, moving to the next one. Uh, next question was like, uh, how was it working with adult film production and someone like a uh, man himself, Dan Harmon? Like, how was oh, which, your experience? Which, with, with what production? I'm sorry. Adult swim. Uh, how, adult swim production. Oh, in-person production? Adult swim. Like, how is it working oh, with adult, adult swim? Oh, adult yeah. swim. Oh, they were great. Yeah, yeah they were yeah. great to work with. Um, a lot of times with like Rick and Morty, they wouldn't really have much in the way of notes. They'd have a couple of notes like, oh, you know, make sure you clarify this or this doesn't make sense or add another line here. And then the calls usually ended up just like, you know, talking about, you know, different things that are the weekends or, you know, go, or, you know, they would just start conversing about other things. But uh, they were really good to work with. They they didn't really give us much in the way of, of notes. There was no. Uh, they give us feedback, but they love the show so much they just figured, you know, do what you know how to do. And that was great. That was just having that leeway and that freedom to to do what we what we wanted. Ah, okay. Uh, I have a personal question. Uh this is mostly because I'm like a huge fan of Rick and Morty. Uh is Rick and Morty and Gravity Falls, do they have any relation? Just just clearing out fan theories here. Well, do they have any what relations? Relations. Like are they connected together? Rick and Morty oh. And Gravity Falls. Oh, <laughs> good question. <laughs> um, well, Justin Royal and, and Alex Hirsch are both good friends. They're, yeah. they're friends together. But there, there is. Uh, I think there was um, one thing because they're, they're different worlds. They don't exist in the same world. But there was one uh, little Easter egg that they put in both. The shows. teleporter scene. Yeah, where <laughs> I think it was uh, yeah. Gunkelstein throwing away a coffee cup. I think it was. Yeah. And in, in an episode of Rick and Morty, that coffee cup flies into a portal into Rick's world. Yeah. But that was just a little Easter egg. They didn't tell anybody about it. They just did it and didn't. It was <laughs> the only Justin, the producer, and the editor knew about it, and and Alex, of course. But yeah, uh, we got the prop from Alex and we put it in, and the animator, of course, knew about it. But they kept it a big secret. They wouldn't tell anybody else on the crew about it. And then when that. <laughs> So that was a big yeah, surprise. And then Santri just exploded on the internet, like, are they connected? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That and also when when uh, when Brian, we killed off Brian Griffin and Family Guy, you know, people yeah. were so upset about that. We never intended to kill him off permanently. He was coming back. So we knew yeah. he was coming. But people actually went out and got tattoos of Brian that said, rest in peace, <laughs> rest in peace Brian. <laughs> He's coming and... back. Let's get a tattoo. He's not dead. Uh, well, I was really hoping that the both worlds are interconnected. Like Bill Cipher versus Rick, just throwing it could, out yeah, it could be. I mean, I mean, <laughs> it's different. They're just different dimensions of the same universe, right? Mm, I hope so. <laughs> uh, uh, you have uh, so other questions? Going, yeah. So, like, we all are a bunch of undergraduates, undergraduates, right? Um, and you, you uh, bagged your first job uh, when, right, when you were in college as a background layout artist. So what do you feel about it? Like, how was the feeling? Like, how do you how feel about this opportunity? Oh, that was, that was amazing. That was, that was, um, 
because I had just expected because I, I moved to Los Angeles from the New York City area. So I, th I thought I would just come out to UCLA and be here for a couple of years and graduate and then go back to New York. I never expected that there would be, you know, that many job opportunities coming up. And The Simpsons really started a big animation boom. So it was, you know, it was just a thrill to be, you know, get that job on that show. And I really tried really hard. I mean, you saw my test was was really terrible, yeah. but um, it, uh, it it. You know, once I got on and got hired, that was like the the biggest thrill because it was um, like I knew this was something big because it was a hit show already. My family was, you know, they were thrilled, um, and it was it was so exciting because you know, once even the show that I worked on finally aired, it's like, oh, my name is on the screen, my name's on TV, and, <laughs> and we were all because a lot of us had come out right out of college. Um, there just was not the animation industry wasn't as big at the time in 1990s, early 90s, as it is now. I think the just the, the animation guild, the, the animation union has doubled or well, more yeah. than doubled since then. So um, so they were they were hiring a lot of younger artists that you know we didn't really know everything we were learning as we went, but just to have the opportunity to make something that everybody just was thrilled about it was it was so exciting. And you know so it's true what they say, you know, the the training uh, uh, success is opportunity needs training so um, or preparation so I was I felt I was prepared even though my first week on the Simpsons I looked around at all these other artists who were so much better than me and I was like what am I doing here I'm out of my league this is this is you know this is crazy how did I get here but yeah. with perseverance and I just kept trying and trying to improve my drawings and improve my work and learn from others that I was constantly, and I still do that today. There's still new things that I'm I'm learning. I, I never stop learning. So always be, you know, I always try to be open to new ways of doing things, new new ways of production pipelines. There's there's so many different ways of of getting to the to the end that um, new softwares come up. So I always have to be yeah. um, adaptable to new new things and ask a lot of questions. So, but yeah, it was just a thrill. It was amazing. Huh. So could we have like. A little can you extend the time a bit like 10 more minutes or something because sure. we have yeah. a couple of questions yeah sure yeah sure thank you uh yeah, thank you. also if not have you uh, one of the questions which uh one of the panelists asked was if not animation uh what would you have like intended to go for like an alternate career path oh, also if I on animation why did you choose 2d instead of 3d animation huh. 2d is a harder as we all know yeah well when i started to 3d animation was kind of in its infancy and um uh, it was more technical than creative and, and it was before toy story came out so um you know i just didn't have i had more interest in in making cartoons like the ones i saw as a kid uh, as, a, as a child so i wanted to make snoopy i wanted to make charlie brown i wanted to make scooby-doo i wanted to make you know animation shows like that i wanted to do um I knew I wasn't as good enough to do like full on Disney feature animation. I've even tried to to test for some some features, but didn't didn't really get anywhere. But um, I always liked TV animation. It was kind of um, uh, kind of always where you know where, where my my passion lied. But with CG animation, it was still too early, and still a lot of technical things had to be worked out, and it was it just took too long. It was too intensely technical for me i wanted to draw and so i didn't do as much and i did have to take uh, i did take 3d computer animation in college but it was a, a much slower program back then where you had to um make you, you your animation and you'd hook up a, a, a movie camera to it and then run a program that took a picture at when the frame rendered and it took hours to render one frame yeah <laughs> a picture. and you render the next frame and take a picture Whereas you know, now it takes you could do it in a couple hours the whole thing, but we had to set up the camera on Friday. Hopefully, you come back Monday morning and you know your computer. Hopefully, it finished rendering. Hopefully, it finished rendering, and if it didn't, if it crashed, you got to start it all over. So it was yeah, that to me was like ah, oh, it takes too long. So I just didn't have the patience for it. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think that and that's why I went into two D. Um, but if I wasn't doing animation, I don't know uh, you know I, what I would be doing. I'd be I'm sure I'd be doing um, some art. Yeah. I, I know. I think I know what you would be doing. Like I saw your amazing paintings on your blog. Like <laughs> yeah, like uh, the cover one painting. I almost thought that's a picture, <laughs> not a painting. 
So, so are those your side hobbies? Like, I'm sorry. Uh, like, do you paint like as a your, hobby? Oh, like it's yeah, I do paint as a hobby, and I've sold some paintings, but not enough to to do it full time. Huh. You know, I'd like to someday. That would be that would be awesome to do paint full time. <laughs> Great, but I also do. You know, just to, it's good to do something creative that's not related to the work that I do every day, because that's that's more personal work for me. I don't have to answer to a network or producers or or yeah. you know, I don't get notes on it. Or somebody says, you know what, make that tree a little darker green or you know add some more trees add another tree here or you know put some more yeah. in I can do whatever what I want so I'm complete control creatively of that so it's good to have that even if it's you know I also you know do gardening and that that keeps me away from the computer so you know I grow vegetables in my garden or, or you know so that that keeps me away from the computer so it, like it it makes me use a different part of my brain so I'm not constantly staring at the computer so I get to go outside and you know get my hands dirty and do something different oh that's nice <laughs> um could you tell us where the uh, world famous quote wabba laba dub dub how like the origin story <laughs> yeah, <laughs> i'm definitely going to ask <laughs> you know, that I was think... one of the most asked question in the chat box too <laughs> yeah i think uh justin just made that up once cuz uh, he he did do a lot of ad libbing with with rick especially even Marty too to an extent like all the st stuttering and just like the burps and um you know he would he would just go off script so much that he would just like <laughs> he just made that up on the fly and we thought that was so funny that he kept saying it then so he kept <laughs> doing it and so it just kind of you know organically became a thing what about making the meaning so sad like i am in great pain why <laughs> the, i'm sorry the, uh, uh, the when bird ma bird person explains the meaning to Morty, he's like, it means I'm in great pain, right? Why yeah. make it so sad? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that, we didn't have that. That came later with uh, <laughs> the, the meaning of what bubble of a dub dub. It was just a nonsense phrase that that uh, he did with Rick, and you know became a thing. And then Morty questioned it, and then so we, they, you know, Dan Harmon then put it in the script, and like, yeah, let's let's give that some some backstory. Let's give that some meaning. And it explains a lot about Rick and, and makes Bertie feel bad about it. But yeah. that's why it was so sad because it was, yeah, yeah, that means he's in a lot of pain. So, you know, be easy on him. So, yeah, it's, but I love that about Rick and Morty that, that it's, that always goes back to like, they'll reuse something. They'll go, they'll even say something like, they'll break that fourth wall and say, it's like, yeah, you remember in season one, we, we went there and did this, you know, it's like, I just, <laughs> they, they don't, you know, they're not stuck to that little box of like, no, it's, 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 they know they're a cartoon show. And the character, yeah. <laughs> it's like they work in on their joke, you know. Yeah. So, like, uh, as you know, we all are like very big fan of yours or all your work. So we all wanted to know, like, uh, what would be uh, your next project we can uh, put our eyes on? <laughs> oh, like, are you um, working on something currently? I just finished an, uh, a Netflix show, and uh, there's a show called Inside Job that I worked on that's coming out. I think this summer if not next spring uh, oh. but just yeah the show just takes so long to, to do um but i i'm um like just i just finished on that so i'm going to be starting up on something else soon too just not sure haven't chosen which project yet that i'm going to be going to be working on but um uh, but that is coming up soon okay so, uh, we're down to our last three questions okay uh, thank you so much staying so long though uh, sorry for the delay. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, um, considering the pandemic, right? Like right now, and everyone's just stuck at home, and everyone has just time to like sit there, draw, practice, everything. What advice would you give to artists just to stay inspired, like just to keep drawing? This. Um. Yeah, that's a good question because it is yeah. so hard because um, because you're you're um, you're kind of isolated, and even you know, a lot of yeah. artists. Especially with the pandemic, a lot of our artists, like either they, they sometimes some of them have roommates, some of them don't, or some of them have families, some of them don't, um, and you're kind of cooped up. But it is the, the challenge is to stay connected. That's that's the biggest challenge. And I, I think what I miss about working in a studio is that we would inspire each other. You know, you walk past somebody's desk, you go, "Oh, that's really cool. I like what you're doing. Draw there." Like, yeah, I'm going to go back and guess when I'm all inspired. Or if you have a question and get stuck in something, you can you can go turn to an artist next to you and say, hey, will you take a look at this and tell me if this works? And 
So you don't have that when you're home working alone. Yeah. So it's hard to get that connection. But I think the important part is to stay connected. And, and I do like calls with friends. Because normally, you know, before the pandemic, I'd go to lunch with friends from different studios and we'd be halfway or something or or go to lunch with the crew or, you know, after after work, we go have you know drinks or something. So yeah. we, we don't have that connection anymore. So it is hard to stay part of the community. So you know, I, I definitely am I'm a big fan of like just staying connected, even if it's like I do you know, once a week with I get together on a Zoom call with friends from different studios. And we just talk about everything from art to literature to, to who's working on what. And, you know, but it's that's the important part, I think, is to stay stay connected. And it, it, as far as like the inspiration, it's really tough to 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 get motivated. But um, yeah, yeah, it's but, you know, well, in your spare time, you like watch other animation, watch, you know, look, pull up things that, that you really like. Let's see how it's made. <laughs> see how it's made and, and um, you know, just get inspired watching other shows. And, uh, check and out little competition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's always a good idea to check out the competition. Yeah. It's like always harder for 3D because you, once, you once you're done with the animation, you have to sit there for like three days waiting for it to render. Then you judge yeah. yourself like, is this good? <laughs> Right, then you don't know. Like, oh, is it good? I don't know because I have to wait till, till the render. Yeah, I go through a constant pain all the time. <laughs> yeah, with with 2D, the render is pretty much, you know, it takes a minute. So you can, with 2D, you can tell right away if it's working. Yeah, I'm hoping for them. Thank you, like 2D now. <laughs> uh, Anurag, you got something? Um, uh, I get all our questions are over. <laughs> wait, wait, no, no, <laughs> this is questions here. Uh, what is your take? Uh, okay. Uh, sir, what is your take on how animated movies have evolved? Like, mm -hmm. first you just see like 2D animation in movies, like Brother Bear and all, and then mm -hmm. suddenly you just see a view where this, in Lion King, when this 2D just became 3D for a, uh, for a split second when him versus Car, and then now yeah. it's just pure, full-on 3D movies which look re almost lifelike with a green screen. Um, so, like, what is your so, take on this? Um, yeah, you know, it's it's... I, I really appreciate the art artistry and and, and the, the technical draftsmanship of of those hand drawn animations because to draw something with a pencil that's just a drawing that then you trace and translate into to the screen that's just amazing to me to do all that without the use of computers but um, it it it's always evolved I mean it's it's you know even the technology when you go back to Snow White to all the way up to to 101 Dalmatians. That's 30 years, I and mean, technology evolves. Even you know, we think of Snow White. It was 19, you know, late 30s. You know, it was only 10 years earlier that you know they added Disney added sound with Steamboat Willie, and it's all you know, just crude black and white drawings. But then 10 years later, you have this beautiful, full color, you know, really well drawn Snow White. So that's just 10 years. But then 30 years later, you've got you know the technology advances a little bit more with Technicolor and and cell xeroxing, so 101 Dalmatians had you know different technologies. So it's it's always it's always evolving. So it's just a natural pro progression to go from from Lion King, which is, a, is also an amazing. Then did have some computer help in there too with the rendering, and yeah. it's still hand drawn, but you know the, the render and, and the color design, you know that had a lot of computer aided technology there too. But it's just a natural progression then to go to get to Toy Story and to get to Frozen. You know, it's just like those are the next things until. Someone comes along with something else that's new, which to me, like after a while, I mean, we've had, you know, it's been like what, more than 25 years since Toy Story. Yeah. Um, to me, a lot of those CG movies start, were starting to look the same. So you started mm. to see a lot the of- Smooth DreamWorks. play like animation. Yeah. 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 It's like, it's almost blurred the line between what a DreamWorks movie and a Pixar movie, because DreamWorks was getting better and better and better. Hmm. Shrek was great. The human characters were still a little clunky in the early Shreks, but they were getting better and improving the software, improving how to use it. And it's just a natural progression then, but but they kind of stagnated, I think, when all the movies started to look the same. The designs were still really cool, like Gru and the Minions. Those were, were, were amazing designs. But um, then when uh, the Spider-Verse came along, when the, the latest yeah. Spider-Man came along, that just blew me away because now all of a sudden that movie looked different than every other CG movie. It's like, it looked more like a comic book. It had different styles, yeah. different different look to it. It wasn't even the backgrounds were not the same recycled, you know, looks anymore. It's like that brought it to a new level. So now I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what happens next. And yeah, 
you know, where, where it's going to go from there, because we have to keep, we have to keep innovating, not just technically, but also stylistically, artistically, we have to keep building on what we've done, you know, in the past to move forward. And otherwise, we're just going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. And nobody wants to see that you want to see something new, something exciting, you want to see, you want to see it move on and, and create something new. Oh, nice. So, like, uh, before we wrap up, uh, I would like to ask you one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one of our attendees is, like, really excited. <laughs> okay, so question is, like, uh, uh, what are some major changes in the animation between season one and season four that uh, we, as a viewer, could notice? Oh, you mean for Rick and Morty? Yeah, Rick and Morty. Between what, season one and season four? Um, yeah. Well, I don't know what they've got planned for season five, but I know they're working on it right now. I think it's in post. Oh. So it's Six coming seasons in the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then they, yeah. they got, you know, the order for 70 episodes a couple of years ago. So they're, you're going to see Rick and Morty for 100 years, 100 years. <laughs> it's, um, I think the, the stories have gotten more, more complicated. The plots have gotten more uh, intricate. And uh, just the, the character arcs, there's just so much more depth to them. Yeah. Just, you know, you know going from you know, Morty's parents splitting up and then Beth being a clone, but that's not the real Beth, but the real Beth was somewhere. So um, uh, all that just like, it just makes the, the whole world of Rick and Morty more and more com complex. And, you know, by episode 100, it's going to be like this whole complete... <laughs> <laughs> One massive wall, like everything comes together. <laughs> yeah, with all these, who knows, there might be a Gravity Falls uh, dimension at that point. So uh, Hopefully. <laughs> That would There's be so many Easter eggs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and just you know, watching the progression from the simple stories of season one, just getting more and more complicated. Yeah. And more, you know, it's like whoa! I didn't see that coming. <laughs> um, okay. There's, there, I think there is one one question here in the uh, about um, being skilled at drawing in order to animate. Yeah. I just um, answered that one real quick. Yes. <laughs> Answer quickly to that. <laughs> I think it's very important. Um, um, you don't have to, to be an animator, that you don't, is if you have a sense of timing and a sense of movement and a sense of motion and filmmaking, um, you don't need to be Michelangelo. You don't need to be the great Leonardo da Vinci artist. You know, you-, you No, no, beat Michael da Vinci. <laughs> I mean, it's great. I would love to be, you know, that that good, but, um, but there's, you know, you, I mean, it's always, best to, to, to have the drawing skills especially but mm -hmm. if you're if you're doing CG animation it's great to be able to draw something because you, if you want something to be a certain way you draw it out first because then you can try to match that with the CG that doesn't yeah. mean you have to be you know I mean I've, I'm surrounded by amazing artists and I'm, I'm every day I'm just blown away that, that they're so much better than me like how am I how am I still here but um, <laughs> But know your limitations, but also work on them and know your strengths too, because your strengths might be in the timing of it. It might not be, you know, and I know a lot of, I, I'm always a big proponent, but you should be able to draw everything. So it does help to at least know the basics of perspective, because you'll know when something's off, or at least know, you know character construction characters and what makes a good character design. Um, but, you know, I know myself, I wouldn't be able to draw, you know, Simba or or Scar or you know because I I can do it but it wouldn't be as good as somebody else so I know what my strengths are and what my weaknesses are so I focus on my strengths um, but still trying to you know improve on my weaknesses but yeah I think it's it's best to you know something in your portfolio I love to see artists that have life drawing uh, perspective drawing uh, animals a lot of artists go to the zoo for the day and just sketch animals yeah um, all that is important so that because I do see a lot of portfolios. So when I see that you can draw, it's like, okay, I don't need to tell you to teach you how to draw perspective. I see that you already know that. So I can I can easily teach you the style of the show, but I don't have time to teach you how to draw. So those are skills that you should come to the table already with that. Uh, okay. I think that's about it. Thank you, sir. Uh, sorry for the Thank chaos, uh, like all yeah. this. <laughs> oh, sorry for the, for the technical. Yeah, so I see yeah no, that's, we, should, we should have like, 
called like you five minutes before and just got oh, okay. through webex uh sorry about that we are not sure <laughs> yeah as long as you can still see me and uh you saw the clips that's, that's yeah important. that was amazing uh yeah. pretty sure people are gonna go cry in nostalgia in the corner right now <laughs> uh thank you for this uh with this we would like to conclude the fifth edition of newton speaks get ready for the 19th of next month when one more legendary speaker comes no hints on who it is yet <laughs> until then uh thank you for your time uh thank you sir uh thank you I, sir. we really hope we can like try bringing you again <laughs> yes this has been a blast uh, why you don't want to come <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah so Bye. okay thank you sir uh this is lavkush this is anurag uh good night good, good night signing off thank Bye. you good night good thank you for having me <laughs> thrill and an yeah. honor just just to be invited and and to share you know we loved your work yeah. as soon as you saw it not no joke <laughs> thank, yeah. so thank you thank you thank you sir bye thank you bye